Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching and listening. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. really means a lot to me. Shout out to two of my sponsors in particular for this one. Creo, eSource, and Viva Sightball. Both are huge parts of a site operation, eSource and eReg, and help with compliance when it comes to protocol adherence, as well as regulatory compliance and the documentation that is associated with both of those things. Now, what are we doing here as researchers, especially sites and site owners and PIs? We, we collect data at the end of the day. And if you're a PI, not only do you collect data, and not only are you the only one responsible for the conduct of the study at your site, meaning you and all your staff members are adhering to good clinical practice, you and all your staff members are adhering to the protocol, you and all your staff members are adhering to ALCOAC, attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate, and complete when it comes to your study operations, your documentation. But you have the added responsibility as a PI of keeping your patients safe. And while this warning letter to a physician, uh, 483, that I'm about to get into, it's one of the reasons I'm bringing it up. Number one, Darshan Kulkarni, who's a good friend of mine, posted this about a month ago, maybe two months ago now. Um, I'm just getting around to it now. The FDA is taking this stuff seriously. and we kind of got to do a better job as sites and we shouldn't rely on the monitors to tell us when we're doing something wrong because a lot of times CRAs and other people at CROs are overworked and they miss things too, or they catch things when it's too late. And whenever in doubt, always document, always email medical monitors we try to do this at my site too, Yuma Clinical Trials. We're a brand new site. We've had deviations as well. Um, so really, this can apply to anybody doing this, this business of clinical research site operations. Coordinators, I'm talking to you. You guys and gals are the workhorses at the site level. So you got to make sure that you guys are being compliant with the protocols as well, paying attention to detail. But ultimately, it's the PI's responsibility, right? And I think to some degree, site management, because they're the ones that the PI is entrusting to conduct the studies with them in partnership with them and the coordinators and the CRAs too. I mean, the, ultimately, the CRAs are on the same team. We're all trying to maintain compliance deviations happen i just did a shorter video on deviations there's out of window deviations there's deviations that impact patient safety there's deviations that don't they're considered minor major generally whenever a deviation has something to do with eligibility criteria it is considered a major protocol deviation um, if they have to do with windows and uh, compliance with dosing, they're usually considered minor. But again, always document, always ask. doesn't hurt as, as a site to document and to keep an open line of communication with your CRA, your sponsor, your medical monitor, whomever the case may be. So in this particular warning letter by Darshan Kulkarni, there was a PI, I'm not going to mention her because, I mean, honestly, it could have been anyone. And this is just, let this be a lesson for all of us out there. Like, document, whenever you're in doubt, ask medical monitor in an email, right? This warning letter, I'm reading it now. This warning letter informs you of object objectionable conditions observed during the Inspection conducted at your site. This was a month-long inspection. So they must have enrolled like a lot of patients. Um, they found a few issues 
The investigational plan for protocol required subjects to have stimulated whole salivary flow rate of greater than 0.1 milliliter a, a minute to be eligible for inclusion. And they failed to adhere to this requirement, specifically subject whatever was enrolled and randomized without having a stimulated whole salivary flow rate at screening. At subject uh, screening visit, as well as baseline, the subject was not able to produce or excrete saliva. As a result, no stimulated whole salivary flow rate for subject was determined at screening or baseline. However, the subject was randomized and received multiple doses of study drugs, study drug over six study visits. This, to me, okay, not doing it, documenting that the patient is not able to do it, and still randomizing them is intentionally creating a deviation, knowingly randomizing a patient into a study uh, when you know that that's one of the exclusion criteria. Uh, to me, I think the FDA would have reacted differently if they would have obtained a salivary flow rate which was still less than 0 0.1 and they just overlooked it like error that happens more often than not i think the fact that this was just ignored is one of the reasons why the fda really cracked down on this site so like ignoring the fact that the the salivary flow rate was not able to be produced because that was documented. So they knew that they needed this data set as part of the IE criteria, and they just ignored it. So the FDA goes on further to say, in your October 4th, 2022 written response, you stated that while you provided paraffin for subjects to chew to help them produce saliva, See, they they know what the requirement was, and stimulated whole salivary flow rate assessment was attempted. The test could not be completed. You stated that you should have communicated with the sponsor to seek an extension of the screening period to allow additional attempts. I agree, they should have. You also stated that saliva production is quite problematic in the study population. And as a result, the sponsor subsequently amended the protocol to remove this inclusion criteria. They just ignored it. You were asked to generate a note to file stating that the screening lab results, physical and detailed conversation with you disclosed the score of for a subject which meets inclusion criteria. Although we acknowledge the difficulties of obtaining saliva production uh, in the study population, this was a key inclusion criteria, and it was not met. I would go further here and say it was ignored. Because, again, it's different to knowingly ignore an inclusion criteria than it is to do it and just ignore. Because it's very easy to have an oversight where there's like 50 IE criteria total, and like you're doing them all but one of them wasn't met, but you inadvertently overlooked it. That's different to me than just knowingly skipping it and saying, well, they even documented it here, saying, well, patient couldn't produce it. We gave them uh, something to try to stimulate it, paraffin. It didn't work at screening or at baseline, and we still did it. Uh, the FDA says, your failure to exclude subjects who are unable to produce a stimulated whole salivary rate of greater than 0 0.1 milliliter a minute at screening raises concerns about the integrity of the data collected at your site, jeopardizes the right safety and well-being of subjects. Further, your response is inadequate because our review showed that contrary to your written response, the criterion of stimulated whole salivary flow rate was not removed from the protocol's eligibility criteria. In fact, all versions of the protocol required a stimulated whole salivary flow rate because this turned out to have been a secondary endpoint. 
which is really important. If you're going to have deviations, number one, don't do them on purpose unless it's to specifically avoid harm to the patient. All right, because you are allowed to do that. It's still a deviation, but you're avoiding harm. You're avoiding a direct harm or jeopardy to the patient. But don't do it on a primary or secondary endpoint or objective of the study, because those are higher, more highly scrutinized. And don't knowingly randomize someone knowing full well, because they documented it, that, well, the patient couldn't produce saliva despite our attempts to get them to do it. So we still randomize them. So again, a deviation is a deviation, but this shows intent to me, and I think that's what the FDA was really after here. The intention was to knowingly randomize someone when they shouldn't have, rather than just overlooking a lab value. Um, which I think is different. I think it's different. But again, what do I know? Um, additionally, regarding the note to file, your response is inadequate because you did not provide a copy of the note to file to support subject's eligibility. So again, always document patient eligibility. You got to always document these things. Note to files are important, not just because a monitor is being annoying and asking you to do note to files. Note to files are important because for cases like this, when an auditor is looking at your files, they're looking also at your thought process and they're looking at your operations. Well, what's the rationale here? And overlooking something is different than omitting, choosing to omit it. So that's where I, th I think the FDA kind of cracked down on this. Uh, the next one required, the next finding they found, same study. Uh, wait, is it the same study? Yeah, it looks like the same study. Required that to be eligible for inclusion in the study, subjects must have a diagnosis of moderate to severe uh, condition with documented x-ray evidence. And they failed to get this inclusion criteria of documented uh, grade three to four uh, x-ray for two subjects who were enrolled and randomized without this. Again, this is the same exact theme. So maybe this, maybe this is not most sites. These are more, now that I'm actually reading between the lines of this warning letter, uh, this is more than just overlooking things or not having tight operations. This is like knowingly randomizing people when you know you shouldn't, uh, unless the coordinator is really dropping the ball. But again, it's the PI's responsibility, but coordinators take note, all right? Two subjects were enrolled and randomized into the study without the diagnosis. You needed the x-ray. Again, I think eSource helps with this. I think eSource like for the salivary flow rate, the way we would design this study, uh, the way we, we would design this source is, hey, what was the salivary flow rate? And then you would have to complete that. It would not let you skip it unless you write a note. Uh, Creo allows you to design the source in such a way that you can't skip something unless you document, well, why are you skipping it? So then somebody knows, okay, at least there's a rationale. Maybe I want to complete this visit, but I want to like leave this unchecked because we're not sure how to proceed. All right, but just skipping it, just to skip it, uh, you're clearly violating the protocol on purpose. That's to me, again, that intent matters to me. And same thing with the x-ray, just not having the x-ray when the protocol says you need to have the documented radiologic evidence says that you are just doing whatever you want to do. It's different than, again, overlooking a lab value at screening and randomizing a patient. That's still a protocol deviation, 
but at least the intent right is that you are following the protocol uh and then they have more um another study so i guess they they audited two studies and they just have more of the same um and then there's also findings they found with the dosing where they had to have the dosing done on certain um, injection sites, but the site decided just to do the injection site the same place all the time. Um, so again, does eSource and eReg help with this stuff? Yes. Is it a magic wand? Will it like completely prevent these kind of things from happening? No. Again, if a PI really wants to randomize someone when the protocol says they shouldn't, they still can. It's just not a good idea, especially when you're running the risk of FDA auditing you and sponsors auditing you. At my site, the way I get around these things, and there's no really getting around. If a patient can't produce saliva, they can't produce saliva. Now, you could write note to files like the sponsor and CRO asked the site to do. You can try to extend the window to try to get more time to get the patient to produce saliva. But the, at the end of the day, they either can or they can't. And you can't knowingly randomize someone when you know that's a requirement and they're not able to produce saliva. Same thing with the x-rays. You can't. I wish we could randomize patients that don't meet IE criteria. You can't. But. These findings, and again, I think the FDA is really looking at the intent here. Uh, protocol deviations can happen even without intentionally randomizing someone that you know doesn't belong. Like, if you have enough protocol deviations, if you're just not paying attention, that is also like a cause for an audit. That's also a cause of a potential warning letter during an FDA audit. So just having better operations, having a QA, QC, whatever you call it, quality control, having a third, a second and third person just looking through the IE criteria. We're not perfect at UMA clinical trials. We've had protocol deviations. We've had, we've been around two and a half years. We've had, um, I want to say two that I can remember eligibility issues um inadvertent of course but still eligibility issues that we overlooked and, and it, it happens but i think here is was the intent and then when it does happen we always retrain staff we document it shout out to creo and viva for that free training logs um and when it comes to Viva Sightball, it's free. You don't have to pay for it at all. E-signatures. You can tra retrain your staff and document it on training logs. Um, Kappa plans, corrective action, preventative action. How will this? How will you make sure this doesn't happen again? Again, we have coordinators backing it up. You can remodify your source. So we we've redesigned our e-source on those particular studies where we have had eligibility. Uh, deviations to where it kind of protects against that happening again you don't just knowingly ignore it and i think the fda does look at those kind of attempts but if you just have a bunch of deviations because you're not paying attention that's an issue in and of itself and it's not a green light to get sloppy on your operations either and at the end of the day Sponsors are paying us for good data. Sponsors are paying us to be adherent to the protocol. It's not the CRA's job to ensure that we are 100% compliant with the protocol. It would be nice, but CRAs are human. CRAs are there to kind of help us proactively avoid issues in the future. And if you do have any big issues like eligibility issues, that they're not repeated should you get audited at some point. But at the end of the day, the responsibility is on the PI. And then the second derivative of that is site management. And at my site, that's me. 
I'm the site director. I got to make sure these things don't happen too often. And always document, always document your rationale, always get medical monitors involved early in the process. If you know you might be having a deviation, put it in an email to the medical monitors, ask them what they think. We just had a situation on one study where a patient's taking a medication off-label that's not allowed. I talked to the medical monitor on email. It's documented, hey, if the patient stops up by this next visit, it's still allowed by the protocol. Okay, I understand. These are the kind of things we need to be doing proactively as sites. Someone has to be on it. Someone has to stay on top of it. Quality control, quality assurance. But this just goes to show, and let me go read the LinkedIn post from Mr. Kulkarni himself, Darshan Kulkarni. So if I look up this PI's name, which I won't name, even though they could have done a lot to avoid this, like not enroll the patient. The thing with me, the thing that gets me about this particular case is that it's not inadvertent. Like, they didn't just make a mistake. It wasn't just sloppy operations. They knowingly, on multiple occasions for different issues, just said, you know what, F it, randomize. And I wish it was that easy. <laughs> this would be a really good business if that were the case. Unfortunately, and probably fortunately for all of us, because we're all patients at the end of the day, the FDA is taking corrective actions and they're doing their job, at least in this case. So this was the commentary from Darshan. Um, on uh, Specifically on his impact to site owners. This warning letter serves as a critical reminder for clinical research site owners about the importance of strict adherence to investigational plans and protocols. It emphasizes the need for rigorous compliance, ensuring that all inclusion and exclusion are met and that the study is conducted as per the protocol. Transparency and communication, open communication with sponsors, and proper documentation to support decisions, all of which I've said. Ongoing monitoring and training, regular reviews, training, and checks to ensure that the site is operating in compliance with all regulatory requirements. I just wanted to add a caveat, or maybe not a caveat, but an additional thing that triggers audits. Software. These days, everything's being tracked. Clue points. C-L-U-E points. Clue points. It's one of the risk-based quality management um, softwares that the FDA actually uses. So it flags everything from number of deviations per site, deviation rate, screen failure rate, too high, too low compared to the norm, not good, AEs, AE reporting, SAE reporting, all these kind of things are being looked at. And when you're standing out, when you're an outlier as a site on any of these and maybe other metrics I didn't name because I don't have the answers, I'm not, I didn't architect the FDA and what triggers their audits, but just know everything is being looked at and it's not just by humans, it's algorithms. So from Clue Points website, one of the quotes says, the error magnitude, too small to be detected using traditional on-site monitoring, was revealed instantly using statistical analysis methods, enabling investigators to take swift corrective action, replacing all defective thermometers before it could impact data quality or integrity. This was in the case of a vaccine study where several sites had recorded significantly lower mean body temperature than other nations. The algorithm picked it up. This is being used by regulators, by sponsors, by CROs, apparently by sites. So check it out. Clue points if you're a bigger site. No way am I sponsored by these guys. I actually never heard of them um, until very recently. But let's remember what we're doing, what we're here for. 
and the fact that we are all patients and it's in all of our best interest to record as good data as we possibly can and not get sloppy and definitely not get arrogant or enough hubris to the point where you're randomizing patients knowingly when they shouldn't be. That's it. Let me know your thoughts. We need to discuss more of this at SOS. Saveoursites.com. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Bye-bye.